Welcome back to the Dinosaur Channel. This is your home on the internet for all things dinosaur and prehistoric. I'm Tall, and today, after four years and 115 episodes, we'll be going on a deep dive on a topic that basically makes up the very core of this channel. We'll be discussing, what is a dinosaur? Let's look into the scientific definition of a dinosaur. This video topic has been covered many times on YouTube, but by many different channels, some of which have even inspired this channel's creation. That being said, we wanted to take our own take on it here on the Dinosaur Channel and really give you guys an informative, detailed, deep dive into what is the difference between a dinosaur and another animal. Let's look into the scientific definition of a dinosaur first, and what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur. We're also going to look into the link between dinosaurs, reptiles, and birds, and to see how they are all somehow related. But before we do, make sure that you subscribe and turn on the notifications so you don't miss any new episodes. As well, you can become a member on this channel and get some cool perks for it. It doesn't cost that much, and it goes a long way in supporting this channel, create the amazing content we do here. These videos actually cost me a pretty penny to produce, and while I have a full-time job traveling the world making YouTube videos on that channel, I would love to make the Dinosaur channel my full-time gig, so supporting me during this process would be amazing. So ask any random person what they think dinosaurs are, and they'd probably say it's a big, scaly, deadly lizard that went extinct millions of years ago. So let's pose the question. So what is a dinosaur? If we go look it up in the dictionary, a dinosaur is defined as any member of a group of extinct, often very large, carnivorous or herbivorous archosaurian reptile. They have the hind limbs extending directly beneath the body and include chiefly terrestrial bipedal or quadrupedal ornithischians, such as ankylosaurus and stegosaurus, and saurischians such as sauropods and theropods. These guys flourished during the Mesozoic era from the late Triassic period to the end of the Cretaceous period. But then when we scroll down and see that there's an additional definition, it says any of the broader group that also includes includes all living and extinct birds. We'll go into that later. And unlike what a lot of people think, not all dinosaurs live during the same geological period. The Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, lived during the late Cretaceous period, about 72 million years ago. The Stegosaurus lived during the late Jurassic period, about 150 million years ago. The Stegosaurus was extinct for 66 million years, way before the Tyrannosaurus ever walked on Earth. Movies like Jurassic Park and other dinosaur fiction and media tends to scrunch all of these animals together in one big bunch, but dinosaurs actually existed for such a long time time, they way outscaled the amount of time that we ever evolved and existed on this planet. And there are so many mysteries still left to know about what exactly dinosaurs are. We just have a very small glimpse through the fossilized material left on planet Earth. So in 1842, the British naturalist, paleontologist, and biologist Sir Richard Owen coined the term dinosauria. The name was derived from the Greek word dinos, which means fearfully great and saurus meaning lizard. According to the article from the Smithsonian Magazine, Owen kept an eye on what his contemporaries were discovering. He noticed something strange about some of the petrified reptiles that were found during the early 19th century. At that time, scientists weren't sure what they were or whether the fossils were related to one another. So Owen set about trying to pinpoint the mysterious relationship. He concluded that Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and a third species called Hyaliosaurus all had skeletal similarities in the hip. These features included five fused vertebrae at a part of the hip called the sacrum. Owen wrote in his 1842 report, Peculiar among reptiles these sacrum are, he argued that this was sufficient grounds for establishing a distinct tribe or suborder of saurian reptiles, in which he proposed the name Dinosauria, or Terrible Lizards. So the earliest dinosaurs appeared roughly about 250 million years ago, during the Triassic period, when most of the Earth's land masses were joined together as the supercontinent of Pangaea. Over millions of years, Pangaea split apart, causing the dinosaurs to disperse and adapt to their specific habitats and diversify, giving rise to many new dinosaur species. It is estimated that more than 1,000 species of dinosaurs have roamed the Earth. I personally think it's probably way more than that. But before we go deeper into the different species of dinosaurs, let's look into the main characteristics all dinosaurs share. One of the most significant characteristics that dinosaurs have that sets them apart from other animals and this might be kind of funny or obscure to you guys, but it comes down to their legs. Actually, the positioning of their legs. Reptiles had legs positioned to the sides, with their bodies suspended between them. Just think of the modern lizards, turtles, and crocodiles that we have today. Their limbs splay beneath them when they walk. Dinosaurs, on the other hand, had an upright stance with the legs perpendicular to their body. This main feature is what sets dinosaurs apart from reptiles. Dinosaurs had either an upright bipedal gait like that of modern birds, or if they were quadrupeds, they had a stiff, straight-legged style of walking on all fours. This change in anatomy allowed the legs of dinosaurs to be pulled beneath the body to act as towers rather than bridge supports. This small adaptation made it possible for dinosaurs to take less effort moving around. As well, dinosaurs lived on land, not in the sea. So creatures like the Ichthyosaurus, Elasmosaurus, and Plesiosaurus are not really dinosaurs. They're actually ancient marine reptiles. 
And what about the pterosaurs, the dinosaurs in the sky, the one you guys all know and love? Nope, we've covered this extensively across the channel. These are also not dinosaurs. Those belong to another order of flying reptiles, known as pterosaurs. So next, the dinosaur skull had a hole between the eye socket and the nostril. This feature is shared by all archosaurs, as you can also see this feature in birds and crocodiles. And lastly, dinosaurs also had two holes behind their eye socket. Large, strong jaw muscles went through the holes to attach directly to the top of the skull. And because of this, the jaws were able to open wide and clamp down with more force. Oh, and like other reptiles, dinosaurs laid eggs, of course. So let's take a closer look into the dinosaur family tree. The dinosaur family tree. Dinosaurs come in different shapes and sizes, from tiny insect hunters to giants that weighed over 70 tons. There were armored dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs, crested dinosaurs, long neck dinosaurs, dome headed dinosaurs, sickle clawed dinosaurs, duck billed dinosaurs, and flesh ripping dinosaurs. Most lived entirely on land, but some frequently waded into lakes and rivers. Imagine more than a thousand diverse species of dinosaurs walked the earth a million of years ago. So all the dinosaurs descended from reptiles called archosaurs. The name archosaur means ruling reptiles. It's defined as any of the various reptiles, including all crocodiles and all birds and all descendants of the most recent common ancestor. These creatures are members of a subclass that also includes the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, or flying reptiles, and several groups of extinct forms, mostly from the Triassic period. From there, dinosaurs branched out into two major groups, Sarischia and Ornithischia, based on the shape and orientation of their hips. This grouping was proposed by British paleontologist Harry Seeley in 1887. In Sariscian or lizard hip dinosaurs, such as the T Rex and Diplodocus, the pubic bone faced forward and down. In Ornithischian or bird hip dinosaurs, such as the Triceratops and Parasaurolophus, the pubis faced backwards and down. So let's talk about the Ornithischians. So Ornithischians are composed of armored dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs, duckbill dinosaurs, and their relatives. There were many kinds of Ornithischian dinosaurs, dating back to the early Jurassic. Ornithischians shared a unique bone called the predentary. That is a part of the dino's skull, highlighted in green in this picture. This bone was located at the front of the lower jaw, where it extended to the main lower jawbone. Together with the tip of the upper jaw, it formed a beak-like apparatus used to clip off plant material. Ornithischians also had a narrow eyebrow, or a palpable bone, across the outside of the eye socket. These animals had a reduced or even closed off anteorbital fenestra, the opening in the skull in the front of the eye. Ornithischian jaw joints were lowered below the level of the teeth that were then closed formed a solid sort of wall of sharp ridges used to chop off vegetation and they had leaf-shaped cheek teeth i'm imagining their mouth kind of worked like clippers just chomping away plants with ease and also ornithischian backbones were stiffened near the pelvis by ossification or hardening of tendons above the sacrum or the tailbone ornithischians had at least five sacral vertebrae attached to the pelvis i wasn't really sure what sacral vertebrae means oh well, apparently its main function is to connect the spine to the hip bones provide support in weight bearing and transfer while the animal walks and also acts as a protective shield enclosing the organs and nerves of the lower back. There were many kinds of Ornithischian dinosaurs dating back to the early Jurassic. There's a group, Ornithopoda, which includes the Hadrosaurs or duckbill dinosaurs, the Iguanodonts, and the Heterodontosaurs. The group's Ceratopsia included the horned dinosaurs like Triceratops. There's the Thyroperia, which also included armored dinosaurs like the Ankylosaurus and Stegosaurus. And then there's Pachycephalosauria, the extremely thick-skulled Pachycephalosaurus, also some of my favorite dinosaurs. Let's talk about the Sariscians. Sariscians are distinguished from Ornithischians by having a grasping hand that is nearly half as long as the rest of the arm, or longer, asymmetrical fingers, and a long mobile neck. The Sariscians formed two major groups, Sauropodomorpha and Theropoda. The Sauropodomorpha were large quadruped herbivores such as Patasaurs and Diplodocus. The name comes from Greek meaning lizard-footed form. And while they are plant eaters, early Sauropodomorphs were speculated to have been omnivores, since their closest relatives are carnivores. This group also contains prosauropods, which were the sauropods ancestors. These were smaller creatures that were often able to walk on two legs. It's speculated that as their size increased, the sauropods evolved a four-legged gravitatorial gait, adapted to weight bearing by slowly walking on land, like tortoises and elephants. Anyway, sauropodomorphs had a small head and a neck that is at least as long as the trunk of the body and longer than the limbs. Its long necks allowed them to access higher foliage, thus access to more food. Its teeth were weak and shaped like leaves or spoons, and instead of grinding teeth, these creatures had stomach stones or gastroliths, similar to the gizzard stones of modern birds and crocodiles to help digest tough plant fibers. The front of the upper mouth bends down in what looks like a beak. Sauropodomorphs also had large nostrils or nares and had a thumb with a big claw which may have been used for defense, although their primary defensive adaptation was their extreme size. Some of these creatures were the largest and heaviest dinosaurs that ever existed. But they weren't always as big. One of the earliest known sauropodomorphs, Saturnalia, was small and slender, only about 1.5 meters or 5 feet long. 
By the end of the Triassic, sauropodomorphs were the largest dinosaurs of their time, and they just kept growing throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. The largest sauropods like Supersaurus, Diplodocus halorum, Patagonia titan, and Argentinosaurus reached 30 to 40 meters, or 31 to 98 feet in length, and could have weighed 60,000 to 100,000 kilograms, or roughly 65 to 110 tons in mass. The sauropod limbs were heavy and solid. Sauropods had broad feet and walked on the soles of their feet. Their toes were generally short, blunt, and broad. But some sauropods had a large, straight claw on the first digit of the forefoot, and the first and second toes of the hind foot. These animals must have moved pretty slow, and with only short steps because of the inflexibility of the limbs. Imagine running with bulky legs. Anyways, the sauropods' tremendous size placed them out of reach of predators, and they probably don't have any need for speed. Sauropods were at first thought of as swamp or lake dwellers because of their legs and were thought to be incapable of supporting their great weights. And that would have been nice. I too would rather float around in the water rather than walk if I was so massive. Anyway, Sir Richard Owen identified the first known sauropods as giant aquatic crocodiles and called them cediosaurs or whale lizards because they were so large and because they were found in aquatic sediments. Further studies prove that these animals were neither crocodiles nor aquatic. Experiments with fresh bone samples have shown that sauropod bones could easily have supported their estimated weights. Plus, there is no feature in their skeleton suggesting that these creatures were aquatic or even amphibious. In addition, numerous trackway sites' footprints clearly prove that sauropods could navigate on land or at least where the water was too shallow to buoy up their weight. It is more than possible that these animals were floodplain and forest inhabitants. Now on to the next group of Sauriscians, the Theropoda or Theropods. The name comes from the Greek words which means wild beasts. These were the bipedal carnivores ranging from the chicken sized Compsognathus and the fearsome Deinonychus and Velociraptor to the crested Dilophosaurus and the gigantic Tyrannosaurus rex and Giganotosaurus. This group includes all known carnivorous dinosaurs as well as modern day birds. But some of you guys might ask, you said Sauriscian means lizard hip. Why aren't the birds under the bird hipped Ornithischians? Well, good point, but we'll get into this a little bit later. Theropods varied in size from the smallest dinosaur, the crow sized Microraptor, up to the great Tyrannosaurus and Giganotosaurus, which grew up to 15 or more meters or around 50 feet long, stood more than 5 meters or 16 to 18 feet tall, and weighed 6 tons or more. These creatures had teeth that were pointed slightly curved backwards and serrated. They also had huge recurved claws on the fingers. Theropods also had distinctive joints in their lower jaw, bony projections on the neck vertebrae, and unique transition point in the tail where the vertebrae became longer and more lightly built. Other similarities include reduction or loss of the outer two fingers, long end joints of the fingers, and strap-like fibula or calf bone attached to the crest on the side of the tibia or shin bone. The hind leg bones of theropods were hollow to a varying degree, extremely hollow and lightly built in small to medium sized members such as Compsognathus, Silurus, and Ornitholestes, among others, and more solid in the larger forms like the Allosaurus, Displatosaurus, and Tarbosaurus. So again, theropods were bipeds, meaning they walked on two legs. Their hind legs were dominant and designed for support and movement. The forelimbs, on the other hand, were much smaller and only did limited movement and cannot support the body. I don't know what happened, but theropods somehow evolved into having powerful legs and tiny arms. I wonder sometimes if evolution would have just let theropods continue on their path, would they eventually have just lost their arms altogether? At least some of them. Theropods' hind limbs were either very robust, sturdy, and perfect for weight bearing as with the Megalosaurus, Allosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus. Some had very slender, elongated, or adapted for running proportions as well as the Coelophysis, Silurus, Ornitholestes, and Ornithomimids. Theropod feet, despite the group's name, which means beast, as in mammal foot, usually looked like those of birds, which not surprising because birds inherited their foot structure from these animals. Three main toes were directed forward and splayed in a V-shaped arrangement. An additional inside toe was directed along the midline or backward. Then the whole foot was supported by the toes, which had the heel not touching the ground. And theropod toes usually had sharp, somewhat curved claws. Theropod forelimbs varied from the slender, elongated ones to shorter, more massively constructed, grasping appendages. Some had really short arms and hands, some had stout limbs with a single finger each, and some even evolved into wings. The hands usually featured long, flexible fingers with pronounced curved claws which bore sharp, piercing talons. Early theropods such as Coelophysis had four fingers. Most theropods were three fingers, having lost all remnants of the fourth and fifth fingers, Tyrannosaurus, like the Tyrannosaurus, Albertosaurus, Tarbosaurus, and Displatosaurus, were known for their two-fingered hands and unusually short arms. And then we have the odd Mononychus, which lost even its second finger, leaving only a bizarre thumb. Now the jaws of theropods are noted for their sharp, blade-like 
teeth. Nearly all theropods had serrated teeth. Most were compressed and had serrations along the rear edge and often along the front edge as well. Tyrannosaurus teeth had a rounder, less compressed cross section, better adapted to puncture flesh and tear it from bone. Troodontid teeth had recurved serrations that were a bit larger than those typical of theropods. Archaeopteryx and other basal birds had narrow waisted teeth with very little to no serrations. Some theropods, such as most ornithomimids and oviraptorids, had lost most or all of their teeth. So a series of unusually preserved theropod dinosaurs have been discovered in deposits from early Cretaceous period, around 146 million to 100 million years ago, in the Liaoning province, China. These theropods have filamentous integumentary structures of several kinds that resemble feathers. Such structures indicate that today's birds very likely evolved into theropod dinosaurs. Now on to the feathers and birds. So now we're going to talk about whether dinosaurs had and how birds are considered as the only living dinosaur. This is from episode 11 of the Conversation Weekly podcast. The podcast interviewed a couple of paleontologists about dinosaurs and how new discoveries have changed our understanding of what dinosaurs look like. There were discoveries in the mid-1990s of feathered dinosaurs from China. It's called the Jehel Biota, an ancient ecosystem where feathered dinosaurs flourished. Maria Mikanarma, a professor of paleobiology, said that the first papers that were published back then was on this dinosaur called Cynoceropteryx, and it preserves some kind of brown furry stuff associated with the head and the back of the tail. When you look closely at it, it looks like short hairs, about a centimeter long. These were interpreted quite controversially back then as primitive feathers and fairly intensely debated for at least 10 years about what those features were. That paper demonstrated evidence for feathers in the dinosaurs. It effectively provided a direct link to the avian dinosaur relationship. And also, they were showing that feathers aren't unique to birds. They actually evolved much earlier. So what were feathers for? Feathers evolved before flight, and many have functioned as insulation to keep dinosaurs warm. The feathers were all over the dinosaur's body. It is actually possible that the feathers were more for thermoregulation and maintaining body temperature. About half of all specimens that have been recovered in Jehel Biota have a clump of feathers at the end of the tail. It is thought that maybe this feature was used for signaling, potentially by males, or as a display feature to attract males. We're pretty sure that these feathers were being used for communication nonetheless. Another cool thing to note is that in 2010, a team of researchers based in Bristol, England, in the United Kingdom and Dublin, Ireland, managed to reconstruct the colors of the Cynoceropteryx feathers. The team recovered the evidence of pigments in the feathers of Cynoceropteryx, and what they found is that it almost certainly had color banding along the tail. And by using melanosomes, granules of melanin pigment, the researchers were able to paint an accurate color picture of the feathers at least. They also found out that the Microraptor had a glossy, iridescent sheen in its feathers. The Anchiorinus, a Jurassic dinosaur, had feathers that were mostly gray with some black and white stripes on the wings and a big red head crest. But more than knowing that not all dinosaurs were silly green and scaly or gray and scaly, studies like this changed our knowledge of dinosaurs. Not only do we know that they were feathered, we know now what these feathers were used for, which is most probably for body temperature control and also communication. For a while, all finds of fossilized feathers came from theropods, and that existed later in the dinosaur era. In 2014, paleontologists reported complex feathers in a type of ornithischian dinosaur, the Colindatodromius. It was from a site in Siberia and it had three types of feathers. It had simple filaments, similar in Cynoceropteryx. It also had some weird ribbon-like filaments, which had been reported in theropods and it had clusters of filaments. What they had found was that this dinosaur had a genetic ability to produce feathers. This means that the feather gene, so to speak, must have been old. So they looked at an even older branch of the dinosaur family tree, the pterosaurs. The pterosaurs are huge flying creatures with wings of up to 15 to 20 meters. Most of us would think that this skin would be dry and scaly or leathery, right? Well, the mind-blowing thing is that the researchers actually reported the preservation of branched feathers in pterosaurs. This is so freaking cool. Then again, it might take some getting used to for people to imagine dinosaurs as feathered creatures and not some scaly green monsters. Most of the discoveries of feathers were found in the ancient ancestors of modern birds, the theropods. But theropods are soriskin, lizard-hipped. Aren't the Ornithischians called the bird hip dinosaurs, therefore they should be the ones related to birds? Well, ironically, the bird hip dinosaurs are not closely related to birds at all. So birds are derived from the lizard hipped dinosaurs and not from the bird hip Ornithischian dinosaurs. The bird hip condition of the pubis pointing towards the back of the animal occurred twice independently, once in the Ornithischians and once in the lineage leading to birds. This is an example of a term we like to use as convergent evolution. It's time for a giant side note. Convergent evolution is one of my favorite topics when it comes to biology and evolution. 
It is such a cool phenomenon that happens in the natural world. Convergent evolution is the process in which organisms that are not closely related independently evolve similar features. Adaptation may take the form of similar body form, colors, organs, and other adaptations which make up the organism's phenotype or set of observable characteristics of an organism. Convergence occurs when organisms are required to adapt to similar environmental conditions, like animals living in the same tropical climate but in separate continents. It may also occur when two different organisms occupy a similar habitat, such as two types of snakes both living on the canopy of a rainforest preying on birds. A popular example of convergent evolution is the evolution of wings and powered flight in birds, bats, and pterosaurs. These animals belong to different classes of organisms and therefore have very, very distant common ancestors, the archosaurs. Okay, so fossil evidence shows us that flight evolved in pterosaurs around 225 million years ago. Birds around 150 million years ago, while mammalian bats evolved wings around 60 to 50 million years ago. We were very late to the party when it came to flying. The different wing structure of birds, bats, and pterosaurs are each supported by a modified five-fingered limb. Each limb contains the same bones that make up the limbs of many animals, including humans, whales, and crocodiles. However, the shape of each bone is different between each form. The pterosaur wing has an elongated fourth finger, which the other digits were used as claws. Birds have an elongated radius and ulna, as well as finger bones fused together for strength to support the wing. Finally, the wings of a bat are formed from a membrane that is stretched over four elongated fingers. The reason each of these different bone formations results in the same eventual wing shape is due to the basic physics of flight. Wings that were shaped much differently would not allow an animal to fly. It's the same reason that when we designed airplanes, we had to kind of copy nature. Although birds and pterosaurs share a very distant common ancestors, and birds also share a common ancestors with bats, none of these ancestors had wings or were able to fly. In each of these lineages, the wing is an analogous structure, similar in function but not in structure and evolutionary origin. Alright, side note over. So we can say that Ornithischia, taken literally, is a misnomer, since the Ornithischians have Ornithischian-like hip bones, not bird. -like. Only birds have bird-like pelvises. The group was called Ornithischia because the pelvis looked like that of birds and not the other way around. So birds don't actually belong in the group Ornithischia. These flying dinosaurs belong to the Sauriscian subgroup. Tetanari means stiff tails, and it is a clade that includes most theropod dinosaurs, including Megalosaurus, Allosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Ornithomimosaurus, Compsognathids, and Megaraptorans, including birds. According to DNA evidence, modern birds, or Neotherites, evolved in the early Upper Cretaceous period, around 100 to 66 million years ago. Primitive bird-like dinosaurs are in the broader group Avialia. They have been found back to the mid-Jurassic period, around 170 million years ago. Many of these early stem birds, such as Enchiornis, were not yet capable of fully powered flight, and a lot of these species had primitive characteristics like teeth in their jaws and long bony tails. The Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, which happened 66 million years ago, killed off all the non-avian dinosaur lines. Birds, especially those in southern continents, survived in this event and then migrated to other parts of the world. Fun fact for you is that birds are the closest living relatives of the crocodiles. This is because they are two main survivors of once a huge group called the archosaurs. So birds, also known as avian dinosaurs, have features that are almost identical to some non-avian dinosaurs. Birds shared titanorin features including a ribcage indicating a sophisticated air sac ventilated lung system. Birds also have large recurved claws on the fingers and the same foot structure as the theropods. These creatures also have a distinctive joint in the lower jaw bony projections on the neck vertebrae, and also a stiff but light tail. Birds also don't have the fourth digit of the hand. They have long end joints of the fingers, and strap-like fibula attached to the crest on the side of the tibia. Pretty much the exact same thing that I mentioned earlier while describing theropods. I know we just took a giant deep dive into the world of dinosaurs and what exactly dinosaurs are. Well, my friends, there you have it. This deep dive is just the tip of the iceberg, and I'm sure there's lots to discover still about dinosaurs, and I'm so excited for the future of paleontology because we keep discovering more and more, and probably this video will be completely outdated in 20 years. Who knows? I mean, how cool is it that birds are the closest living things to dinosaurs? I mean, I call chickens dinosaurs. They're just so freaking awesome. And I actually own a flock of really cool chickens in the Philippines, and they show me that they're more and more dinosaur-like as every day goes by. Thank you to everyone who supports us, and to our members, I appreciate you so much. If you want to become a member on our channel, join. It'll go a really long way in supporting us, and if you just want to throw us a donation, our PayPal link will be down below in the description. Again, it costs me a lot of money to make these videos on my own, so I'd really appreciate any support from our wonderful community. I'd love to hear what topics you'd like us to take a deeper dive into next, and we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, dino friends.